name this greenhouse something. You know, greenhouses have been used for centuries to produce a variety of cut flowers, potted plants, fruits, and vegetables. This state-of-the-art facility in Watsonville, California, is more elaborate than most. But all greenhouse facilities demand skilled and knowledgeable management to produce healthy, attractive crops. Hi, I'm Jim Harrigan. In this program, we'll be looking at some important concepts and practices of efficient greenhouse management. But first, we should define greenhouse and look at why we use greenhouses for growing plants. A greenhouse is a structure with a clear covering used for producing plants in an artificially controlled growing environment. We might expand that definition by noting that several environmental factors may be controlled in a greenhouse, including temperature, light, humidity, and air quality. This ability to control the growing environment is the main reason greenhouses are used so extensively for commercial plant and flower production. This is a traditional glass-covered ridge-style single greenhouse. Though glass is traditionally the most popular greenhouse covering, a variety of other materials are commonly used, including fiberglass, polyethylene, and several structural plastics. Here we see a Quonset-style greenhouse covered with polyethylene. But remember, whatever the shape size or covering material, greenhouses and the environments within them must be maintained and managed properly to ensure quality plant and flower production. We'll turn now to several environmental factors of greenhouse management. The most critical environmental factor of greenhouse plant production is light intensity. Light intensity is the only factor that we really can't manipulate on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can manipulate only to a minor degree on a seasonal basis. In addition, virtually all other environmental factors in the greenhouse are adjusted relative to the prevailing light intensity conditions. We use a light meter such as this one to measure light intensity in the greenhouse. In some parts of the world, such as the northeastern United States and northern Europe, supplemental lighting may be provided during daylight hours. This is especially common during long winter months when natural light intensity is low. In areas of high winter light intensity, such as the Sun Belt states, supplemental lighting may not be necessary. Our principal lighting concern is usually to decrease light intensity during summer months, especially for low light crops, such as foliage plants. We decrease light intensity in the greenhouse in two ways. We can hang a screening material such as saran over growing benches. An inexpensive alternative to saran is cheesecloth, although it tends to deteriorate quickly. Or we can apply a shading compound to the outside of the greenhouse. Some plants, such as chrysanthemums, are photoperiodic. This means that they will flower according to certain day lengths or light duration. Although the actual controlling factor is the length of the dark period, we commonly refer to photoperiodism using day length terms. Chrysanthemums are short day plants. 
that is, they'll flower when the days are short and nights are long, as in the fall. We can provide chrysanthemums with short days any time of the year by covering growing benches from the late afternoon until morning with black, light, impervious material. On the other hand, long day plants may require night lighting to bloom. Incandescent lights are most commonly used for this purpose. Again, a manager must be very familiar with the specific needs of the crops being grown, as well as the natural environmental conditions of the growing area. The second most important environmental factor a greenhouse manager has to manipulate is temperature. Virtually every phase of plant growth is affected by temperature, and to produce a high quality crop, a greenhouse manager must provide the correct growing temperature through all stages of development. This is usually referred to as the optimum temperature and relates to the nighttime period. So how can we manipulate temperature in the greenhouse? Well, we'll start by looking at heating systems. There are three principal types of heating systems used in greenhouse production. One of the most traditional methods uses steam or hot water to heat the greenhouse environment. The steam or hot water generated by a boiler travels through pipes placed around the perimeter of the greenhouse and under production benches. The pipes release heat into the air, providing optimum temperatures. Probably the most common heating system used today for commercial greenhouse production consists of a unit heater along with a fan and polyethylene tube. The unit heater, sometimes called a forced air heater, produces heat and blows it toward the fan and tube. The fan inflates the polyethylene tube with heated air which is then distributed throughout the greenhouse through holes in the tube. Even after the heater turns off, the fan and tube system continues to provide air movement around the crop. An innovative system used by some commercial growers uses radiant heaters. These fuel efficient systems emit infrared radiation. Such radiation heats only those objects in its path, as plants, benches, and other structures intercept the radiant energy, they are heated and can be maintained at desirable temperatures. Greenhouse air is not directly heated with an infrared radiation heating system. Though other potentially exceptional heating systems exist for greenhouses, such as solar heating, we've presented those most commonly used in commercial production today. All heating systems should be controlled through a thermostat, such as this one. In addition, many managers today rely on computer systems to help control a variety of environmental factors including temperature. Thermometers are also crucial for successful temperature control. Without them, our thermostat settings may be incorrect. This is a maximum minimum thermometer, which tells us the highest and lowest temperatures reached during a 24 hour period. We'll look next at the flip side of heating, that is, cooling systems. The 
most basic way of cooling a greenhouse involves passive ventilation. By opening the ridge and side vents, we allow warm air to escape while drawing in fresh, cooler air. This cool air helps to keep the temperature down. Active ventilation uses fans and sometimes polyethylene tubes to circulate air in the greenhouse. The exhaust fan used here takes warm air out of the greenhouse. A third cooling system is more elaborate. It's called a pad and fan system. Recirculating water wets a pad at one end of the greenhouse. A fan at the other end pulls outside air through the wet pad, cools it, and distributes it through the greenhouse. At the same time, the fan is exhausting warm air from the greenhouse. The result is a cooling of the greenhouse air. Another method of cooling greenhouses uses a fog system. Fine water droplets are injected by overhead emitters installed on water lines. The droplets draw heat as they evaporate, thus cooling the air. It's important to note that greenhouse temperature control is a complex subject, and a manager needs to become familiar with various systems and specific crop requirements. We've introduced the most common systems used for greenhouse temperature management. Another important factor of the greenhouse environment is relative humidity. Relative humidity is the actual amount of water vapor in the air relative to the maximum amount of water vapor the air can hold at a given temperature. Air can hold more water vapor at higher temperatures. As the temperature rises, so does the amount of moisture the air can hold. We use this tool, a psychrometer, to help us determine the relative humidity in the greenhouse. As with all environmental factors, optimum relative humidity varies with the crop. Additionally, optimum relative humidity is different for daytime and nighttime. In general, relative humidity is increased during the daytime or decreased during the night period. To increase relative humidity in the greenhouse, we need to add water vapor. This can be accomplished with fog or mist systems and by hosing down walkways. As liquid water evaporates, Actual water vapor is added to the air, thus increasing relative humidity. To decrease relative humidity in the greenhouse, we usually use active or passive ventilation. This allows humid greenhouse air to be replaced by less humid fresh air. Our other option is to raise the air temperature in the greenhouse and provide a slight amount of ventilation. This allows the warm, moisture-laden air to be exhausted from the greenhouse. As a result of warming and ventilating the greenhouse air, relative humidity is decreased. Whichever method is used to decrease relative humidity, procedures must be started in the late afternoon for ideal results. Relative humidity is a somewhat complicated aspect of greenhouse management so you'll want to study it further to fully understand this concept. 